the woman she was asking me about was in chapter 12 of Revelation. And, uh, and what the man was, or lady was telling her about, that if, if you look up into the western sky, September, whatever, I can't remember now, you'll be able to see the woman giving birth to the child. What that lady was telling Betty about was the uh, constellation Virga or Virgo. Virgo, that's the woman. And uh, it tells the story of the birth. That, that, and then the dragon was awaiting the birth of that child. So that's, that's that constellation. And I've been told, and I think probably a pastor will be able to explain it better one of these days, whenever he wants to, but uh, there was a time early on when the, the constellations, the stars, told the story of the creation and the salvation and, and uh, the future glory, and it told the whole story of the gospel. And now it's been perverted, and they've turned it into astro astrology. You know, they look and, and it, they've made it humanistic and vulgar and superstitious. But at one time, it was the story of the glory of God and the gospel. But that's what th that lady was telling Betty about. And uh, I don't explain that well because I've never really been interested in that part of Bible study. But let's, let me start over here. Chapter 12. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth, and pained to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceived the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the, excuse me, for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and a half time from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Uh, symbolic imagery here. It is about Israel, the, the Old Testament church. And, of course, Jesus was born of the Jews. And then the devil tried to kill him. You remember the Christmas story, oh Herod tried to kill and he did kill all the children, what, two years and younger in, in that area. So this is it's a, an overview of, of what has happened. Um, and I'm not going to 
go into a description and try to identify all of these symbols because that's not the way I felt like I should do this Bible study. But uh, maybe one day someone or myself can, can do that. But what we're talking about last time and this time is the more obvious. We're not going to talk about symbolism, but things that has happened. We just plain as a nose on your face what is going on. Barna had a survey. I think it was in 2016. It said 77% of Christians believe we're living in the end times. Probably be 100% here. But three out of four in the country, three out of four Christians believe we're living in the end time and that God has sent wake-up calls to us and the world that He's coming and prepare to meet Him. Now, we, last week we referenced some wake-up calls and we talked about some bad things that had happened in the 20th century. Difficult days. And of course, the United States, God protected us. Uh, but it's not so much now. But there was a lot of bloodshed in the 20th century. Uh, uh, types of the Antichrist kept rising up during the 20th century. We didn't pay a lot of attention. But the people who were living under those tyrants paid it a lot of attention, and many of them immigrated to the United States. We're talking about Joseph Stalin, Mayo, Lenin, uh, Pol Pot. Together, these men are responsible for the unnatural death of over 100 million of their citizens. And I haven't, I haven't named all the tyrants. That's just, what, three or four there that I named. And but we didn't have that. We, our guys and gals went into the military and went over there and faced. They didn't face Stalin. As a matter of fact, he was one of our allies in World War II. We got in bed with the devil, so to speak, to win the war. Had it not been for Russia, we, Japan would have given us a lot worse time, and, and Hitler would have given Europe a lot worse time than had happened. But these men were terrible tyrants and and they did that so that they could get that communism in place that utopia that they thought that communism would bring because Karl Marx the father of all of this I think is what they call him he communism derived from Marxism and and uh, today in America we have progressive Marxism and they're forcing us to, of course, they do it with a smiley face a lot of times, but they're forcing us to get in step with them. They're not locking us up in prison. Well, they have done that. They've locked the lady up in Kentucky because she wouldn't go along with the same-sex marriage thing. She was a clerk of court or something or other where she was signing marriage license. Well, so that, so we see that now they're, they're willing to do that to us who stand on what the Bible teaches. So they're trying to force us into this godless way of believing and thinking in America today. It's, a, it's upon us right now, and we can manage it by praying. Yes, I hear so many preachers just sit back and say, well, it's all God's will. No, you just don't worry about it. It's going to happen. I don't believe that. There's a, there's, so far, there's been, what, at the, at Daniel's 70 weeks, there was 69 that's already passed, Now we're waiting on the 70th, which is supposed to be the tribulation week. In between that period of time, it's so far been 2,000 years or more between the Daniel 69th week and the coming on of that 70th week that hadn't got here. It had been the 2,000 years in between there, those years that, uh, the, uh, the Christian years, the grace period, the Gentiles being brought in and grafted in to the family of God. Now, that don't have, God has a time, He knows when it's going to happen, but He also will answer our prayers, and we can hold that off as long as we, we can through touching God and praying for our nation. We can have another great awakening in this country if people get on their prayer bones and seek God and really want that with all their heart. But if we continue to say, oh, well, what will be will be, it'll be. 
And there'll be a lot of suffering that we don't want to see. God's prophecies will always come about. Now, there's one we've seen the year before I was born, and we all know about it. Isaiah 66 and 8. Who hath heard such a thing? Who hath seen such things? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day? Was it? Yeah. Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? Was it? Yes, it was. In a day in May of 1948, Israel become a nation again after 2,500 years of being dispersed or a lot of thousands of years, hundreds anyhow, being dispersed across the earth. And now they were a nation once again. As soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children, May 1948. Let's go to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16, 15 through 18. I was supposed to read this before I said anything, but I got ahead of myself. Matthew 6, uh, Matthew chapter 16, beginning with verse 15. Okay. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Talking to his disciples. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, Flesh and blood, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee, I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will bring, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. This statement, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Do you know how many tyrants have had to try to stomp it out? But we're still here. <laughs> has, was that prophecy and has it come to pass just like God said Jesus said the church is going to continue to happen and it shall even in the toughest of times there will always be a remnant of those who have faith in Jesus Christ now Matthew's gospel chapter 24 verses 9 and 10 Matthew 24 9 and 10. Okay. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. What about that? How, how people are today trying to push away off offensive thoughts and offensive words and offensive beliefs. But he says that many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. Now let's go back to that ninth verse. He said, you shall be hated of how many nations? All of them. Does that include the United States? It does, doesn't it? There's one time the United States is truly mentioned in the Bible. <laughs> there's, not an, there's not another time that I could think of or read or find out that the United States is ever mentioned in the Bible. You have to twist and turn and strain to pull out the United States out of these scriptures. But that one's can, it, we're included. All nations shall hate you. You should be hated of all nations. Now, in the end of the age, God is going to be hated and rejected. The Bible is going to be hated, rejected. The name of Jesus right now is just despised and hated, isn't it? And then the Christians in the world. Now, it's kept under wraps, but you're hated. Well, pretty much. We're not being locked up. Our homes are not being, our doors are not being beat down. 
Our names are not mud. So, you know, it's, it's pretty much under control, it's, if, you, if there's such a thing as a control hate. But it's coming, it's going to come out. We're going to face that. That's why I say we can pray and hold off that flood. Because God can lift up a standard against that flood. But if we don't have faith and we don't pray, the devil's going to have his way. The hatred is here. But it's held back. And I'm uh, glad to say that it is. But it's noticeable in other parts of the world. And on Fox News, I think it was at the first of this year, Fox News had a commentary about, or one of their commentators mentioned the persecution of Christians. And he said 90,000 was killed for their faith in 2016. Now, we're not talking about just a bum that inadvertent, inadvertently fell out there and killed somebody who happened to be saved. That's not what he's talking about. He's saying that 90,000 approximately who were deliberately, knowingly Christians and were killed. That is a tremendous number in one year, 2016. And he went on to say that 600 million Christians are intimidated by their government and their fellow citizens, insomuch that their worship is hindered and their testimony is despised. Now, 600 million, now think about that large number. That's almost twice as many people as in the United States are being intimidated as we speak this morning by their government and their fellow citizens because they are Christians. Remember that verse, Matthew 24, 9, you shall be hated of all nations that's in this world. Now let's go to Psalms in chapter 2. Psalms chapter 2. I'm going to read the 12 verses. Psalms chapter 2. <clears throat> Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. <clears throat> then shall he speak unto them in the wrath and in his wrath, and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Praise God. I will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee then the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way. When his wrath is kindled, but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. That first verse just jumps out at me every time I read it. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? Clearly here in this verse, the heathen are agitated, greatly agitated. And in our world today, is hostilities increasing? Surely they are. Now, not to the degree it was in the 20th century where these tyrants were killing tens and tens of millions and finally all of them together added up to over 100 million. We're not seeing that right now. But if all of these hostilities continue to increase, uh, how much longer can it be before there's a bad conflict? And they got some stuff out there now that can cause, in just an instant, cause millions of deaths just in an instant. And it, it probably happened before Jesus comes back or just after the rapture. Probably something like that will take place. I hope it's after the rapture. And I don't wish that on them. 
But the Bible's clear that many are going to die during the tribulation period. So, but hostilities today are increasing. I heard Hal Lindsey say that in 2017, that's where we're at, there's been 377 mass murders in America. The news are not up on, they're not on the ball, are they? And I'm glad. I, I wouldn't want to listen to all that gore every day, would you? 377 mass murders. Now, not like the one in Texas. But what he was saying is that in our law enforcement, it is considered that if four or more are slain, that's a mass murder. So in 377 cases in America this year so far, and see, the, 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 what we don't have but 365 days in a year. They've already been more murders than there are days in the year. Mass murders. 377 where there was four or more who died. That is hostilities, and they are increasing. Increasing. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? Verse 2 and 3, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. I remember when George W., you remember President W., he, uh, he, I think he coined the word strategery. I never heard it. I think, I think they've kept that as a word, strategery. You can, you can check me out on that because I really haven't run a check on it, but that's what I was told. Strategery was the word he created. But the heathen here in this second verse and third verse, they're, 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 they're They've got they've gotten together here to strategize and coordinate a plan of attack against who? You and the Lord. That's what they're doing right now. They're, but they don't understand that ultimately their plan that they have in force right now, their plan is setting the stage for who? Antichrist. Our own government is ignorant to the point to where there's the, the changes they want to make and impose upon the population is setting the stage. Eu the European Union, they're setting the stage for the man of sin. Most may might be some that know what they're doing, but the majority of the people are they just they don't believe in the Bible. They're doing it because they think that it's going to help this world be safer and more peaceful now look at the ignorance of it they're putting their trust in depraved humanity putting a man who is nothing more than a sinner in charge of the world as, as suicide but they think that that's what they're going to have to do but they're setting the stage for the man of perdition in verse 6 the Lord sees all of this in that psalm and he says, yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I thank God that while all this is developing, Jesus is still at the right hand of the Father. The Father's on the throne, and the Holy Ghost is in here working amongst us, even though that the enemy is already planning his attack. And there's a verse that I've had a hard time with through the years in Revelation chapter 14. When the Bible predicts these things, and when preachers preach these things, and teachers teach these things, Revelation 4 and 12, 14 and 12 says, here is the patience of the saints. <laughs> here is the patience of the saints. These bad things are coming, and here's the patience of the saints. What in the world is God telling us? Here are they that keep the commandments of God, the and the faith of Jesus. See, when we, we don't look to the trouble that lies ahead. We don't look to the circumstances that's developing. 
our patience comes because we look to the one that's soon to come to deliver us from all of this that's befalling upon the world. And if we begin to look here and there at all these circumstances, we will be terrorized. But we're not to look at that. We're, here is the patience of the saints. We look to the Lord. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. We've got to put our trust in him, folks to weather the storm. And, if, and you can tell those that trust the Lord, those that don't trust the Lord. Amen. Well, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. I'm not. Yeah, I didn't say we wouldn't. But I'm saying when we listen to it, when we hear it, that we don't freak out. We don't get troubled to the point to where we're miserable and frustrated and want to kick the can and beat the dog and just, just want to quit and give up. Our, <laughs> He said, here is the patience of the saints. We see it, and we know it better than anybody, but we're holding on. We're not being out of shape. That's the agi they're agitated. See, that's the haters. They call you the hater, but they're they're the haters. Whew. See that? There you go. That's, that's, that's stepping on our toes there. When we see the day approaching, we ought to be busy. Praying, of course, but also being a better witness than we have been. Amen. How many want a soul this year to Jesus? Wow. Well, you probably have contributed to winning a soul. I'm sure that each one of you have... Okay, I'm pretty sure that each of you have made a contribution. You witnessed, and you your your life has influenced somebody. And it's hardly ever one person wins one soul. It's usually a combination. Amen. And then nobody can save that soul. I believe it, the pastor taught that only God can save, and we certainly show them the way. But only God can save. Now, whether knowingly or, un, or unknowingly, the stage is being set for the man of perdition. Now, this has been happening for a long time, but of course now it's speeding up. And let me name some things. I still have a little time left. What about now? Let's go all the way back into the 20th century. Uh, I spent more time in the 20th century than I'll probably spend in the 21st century. 1962. All right. Amen. You're still a kid. Still green behind the ears. <laughs> Prayer removed from public schools. 62. You be careful, you're going to tell your age. 1963. The removal of Bible reading from the public schools. 1973, abortion was ruled a constitutional right. 1973, Roe versus Wade. The Supreme Court decided it was constitutional to kill little babies in the womb. Now, now think about that. Our congressman did not make that law. There's not a law in the books. It was just, none, none of these are, are legislated law. None of them. That's right. And that's unconstitutional. It's not supposed to happen. See how people are blinded? And most people who have finished these public schools never even think about that. And now there's some that are getting wiser. I think that's one of the reasons the election went like it did for the presidency. A man who wasn't too popular won the election, 
uh, because he was a constitutionalist. And people are tired of the Constitution being trampled on. And then the Christians are tired of, of uh, God-haters in the White House. But anyhow, let me move on. We don't want to get that go that direction. 2013, Defense of Marriage Act nullified. In other words, it's recognized that men and women, one man, one woman, that's a legal marriage. But that was nullified. That was legislated, but it was nullified by the Supreme Court. Right. That was a law. Right. It was, and it was nullified. And then 2015, there was a ruling. I said ruling, not a law. It was a ruling that sodomite unions are legal across the United States. My, what a mess that we're getting into. And you know, none of us hate these people. But the consequences that they create by defying God's order falls on us too. And we got to live here. So that's where, that's our gripe. If that's a good, I might not want to use that word, but that's our problem. We know that it's going to cause so many more problems and us and our children and grandchildren got to live in that. And, well, yeah, being taught okay. And, 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 but then we're not taught to hate the sodomites. We're taught that it's wrong. And we know that anything to do with perversion and sin, their circumstances, their circumstances, it's going to happen. It'll not stop. And we got to live in it. So there's our problem. So that's our situation. So that, that was 19, that was 2015. Think about verse 3 in that second psalm. Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Have they not done that over the years? They don't want the Bible. They don't want your beliefs. And they're whacking them away and pushing them aside and doing what they want to do. And there's something else that I have been looking at very closely, and I agree with the people who say this, that we are in a war in this country. We are. Spiritual warfare, but it's, it's, it's also more than that. That's the worst part of it. It's a spiritual warfare, but there's more than that. A, they're calling it a war of attrition. And what does that mean, a war of attrition? The co progressive Marxists continually are changing. They're, 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 well, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Can't be said better than the word says it. The progressive Marxists. And, and they're slowly keeping this pressure on the opposition, which is Bible believing people. Just keep pushing the pressure, keep it on there. That's attrition. Slowly and gradually, this will be turned over to a secular state. And God's not going to put up with that. There's going to be punishment and judgment that's going to befall. And then when you read the Bible and you find out that the, the wars in the last days, you got the Gog and Magog, and then Psalm 81 may be the same as Magog and Magog, but some people believe it's two different wars. Psalm 81 talks about a war. Gog and Magog is a war. And then, of course, you've got Armageddon. And none of these wars mentions or even alludes to the United States. Where are we at? <laughs> Pardon? We sure will. That's another word I want to talk about. We sure are going to be, if we don't pray, if we don't have a great awakening, and a third great awakening, we will be assimilated into the progressive Marxist society, and the remnant that's left will be heavily persecuted and hated. Matthew 24, coming to be. Prophecy is unfolding right before the obvious. We can see it. We know that it is upon us. Illegal immigration is a part of the war of attrition. 
And people say that we hate the, the Hispanics. That's not the deal. They say we hate the homosexual. That's, that's not the deal with born-again people. The deal is we know the consequences of sin. The deal is we cannot afford in this country to pay the Social Security, Obamacare, unemployment, the, the benefits that we have. Some people get housing. Some people get food. Uh, I used to call them food stamps. I forgot what to call them now. We, huh? Snap. We get, so, and, and that's our citizens that we're taking care of. And yet, we're just opening the floodgates and saying, come on, and there's, it is impossible. It is totally impossible to feed all the Hispanics that's coming over hundreds of thousands a year. It's impossible to feed all of the Middle Eastern my immigrants is coming over tens of thousands a year, um, and maybe even a hundred thousand a year, and they're being placed here, there, and yonder, and they're getting the same benefits as you, and maybe even more. And it's all coming from the same treasury, and it is impossible. It's impossible possible for you and I to pay enough taxes to take care of all of this so America keeps borrowing money to take care of it borrowing money borrowing money borrowing money and the the Federal Reserve is accommodating us they're just reaching out there in thin air saying here it is that's magic ain't it they can reach out there in thin air I've heard people teasing about a money tree <laughs> but they don't even reach to the money tree they just reach out of thin air print the money put it in the system that's magic of money, isn't it? And then they charge you the bill. You got to pay for that money that never existed before they printed it. Nothing to back it up. <laughs> I'm sorry. The, the uh, yeah. See, the study of the end time events can be depressing. But look, what did David say? I was young and now I'm old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken, <laughs> nor his seed begging bread. If that doesn't challenge you, if, if the last day's message doesn't challenge you to get close to the Lord and live right, what did we decide when we were studying the praying? One thing is, two things are very certain in your prayer life. One, your prayer is going to be answered. Number two, your life makes a difference. It has influence with God. And, and so, so I'm not trying to <laughs> depress you, but it is depressing. If, unless you can trust the Lord. Wealth redist I'm going to stop with this one. Wealth redist redistribution. Mr. Mr. W. signed into law. Uh, $700 billion to help bail out the, the corporations, the, the banks, and the insurance companies. Those people that live in gated communities, <laughs> that live in anywhere from a half a million to a million dollar house and more, drive Mercedes, and maybe some of you, I'm not knocking anybody drives a Mercedes, but, but they probably paid cash for it. They're just paid for it. And, and, but, and they got in trouble and, and about to lose some, some of their wealth, and our president signs into law, we're going to give them this tarp plan and bail them out. I lost my job. And I took a job making half the pay. Bush didn't even care. The congressman didn't, didn't matter. But they bailed out the guy who owns 1% of the wealth of the country. Yeah. 
Well, it's, there's a lot of preachers that know this and know it better than me, but they choose not to talk about it. That's, come on now, they choose not to talk about it because of Sister Nora said we're supposed to leave here happy. <laughs> and all of this information is not happy stuff. But it lets you know where you're at. The, the truth is, is a painful thing sometimes, Pastor. Oh, well, we, we pray. We pray. That's the thing. We can pray, and we can make a difference with our prayer, but sometime out there in the future is coming to an end. It's amazing. Yeah. They walk in shooting. Yeah. Before they even got out the door, another man picked up the Bible, took the book, and said, the right. world will go forth, and they haven't quit. No. We're depressed because in our American westernized mind. Yeah. You're right. We have not let go of this war. No. They're persecuted, executed, and still look happy. Yeah, they do. Joyful. Right. Uh, 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 we're trying to figure out any time, any reason to cancel a church service. Getting flurries of snow. Oh, we're gonna cancel church, and everybody shows up to Walmart. Yeah, yeah, they do. Buy that bread and milk. <laughs> but they're sticking it out. Yeah. They do what they want to do. Absolutely, brother. That's it. Our mindset. 
Right. What we should be depressed about is my brother is lost. That's it. My husband is lost. My children are lost. That should discourage and should drive us forward. Should do it. But we're really concerned about the And lose your 401k and all this. Fulton. Yeah, that's true. Fulton Lake. Yeah. There it is. We're too busy. Yeah. Right. Well, now the emphasis. Yeah, everybody, no matter what you believe. <laughs> no, it's not. No, it's not. And that's another thing we could have talked about about the end times is is, is that uh, uh, homogenized. Oh, no problem. Everything, everything good. Amen. But what we're talking about, the Bible looks at it and says this in, in, in Revelation 14 and 12, here's the patience of the saints. Well, we don't look at it like that, do we? It gives us greater hope, and we have patience to endure it. Now this this verse I'm gonna I gotta close it's ten till I should have I meant to already be closed closing, but this verse three let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. I want to paraphrase that. Let us be free to commit every kind of sin our minds can imagine. <laughs> let us be our own judges. Let us be our own gods. We don't need God. That's the attitude of our leaders today. It's a paraphrase. Part part of mine and part of somebody else's, and so, you know, you just you just study and you say, well, <laughs> but this is what they're saying. Yeah. Oh, no. Yes. I've been over there in Iran, and, and the guy that was a gate guard, he had he had a little old bitty burner like I could take to camping with you. Little cylinder on the bottom. And he heated his tea and he ate goat cheese and unleavened bread, just a little piece of it. And that's all he had. That was his that was his meal. And I guess that's nutritious. But what do you have for lunch? Whatever you want, you see. Yeah, but over there they're used to that. But but let me finish up with this. I pronounce it Haggai, Haggai. Haggai chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, where God is talking about the beginnings of the tribulation and tribulation period. Haggai makes his prophecy. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations. See, the United States is mentioned there. I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. And there, there will be again the patience of the saints. We know that God is going to set up a thousand-year reign with Jesus Christ as king. That's coming, and we're to be excited about that. Not just down and out. We endure. We hold on. We keep on keeping on because we know that well, we know the end of the chapter, don't we? We know the last straw. He said in verse seven, and I will shake all nations, includes the United States. Psalm chapter two, it points out the violence, the chaos, the confusion, the calamity. It just points it out, and it's happening in the United States and the world. 
And it gives, if you continue to read, and I'm not going to take the time to do it, it's late. The second Psalm, you'll see that there's a way out. Bow the knee to God. That's a message to the world. We need to bow the knee to God, confess our sins, repent, and ask God's forgiveness. And the troubled waters become calm again. See, we're not supposed to have troubled waters when we think about the bad things that we just talked about. We're supposed to be patient because we know the Lord is coming back. And I do believe the rapture takes place. I believe they say the rapture, some of them say it's the beginning of tribulation, some mid trib, some at the end of the tribulation period. I can't see the saints going up and then making a U turn and coming right back, set up the thousand year reign. I just can't see that. In the mid trib, all, all the Christians that are faithful are going to be dead or maybe holed up in some cave in some mountain somewhere, you know. I think the church. Is going to be raptured away beginning of tribulation or before it begins. I believe that with all my heart. That's my hope. That should be your hope. We see the trouble brewing. Lord, even so, come Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this Sunday school lesson. We thank you.